All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Driving Your Career panel with Women in Autonomy. We are so glad that you're here. My name is Jen Deitch. I'm one of the program managers of Women in Autonomy. And if you're just getting to know our organization, we are a group of people that's here to educate, equip, and empower women in the automotive and auto tech industries. And our mission is to really embolden women in this space to become leaders and change makers so that your voices can be better heard and represented. I think it's a fantastic time for this panel. We're just closing out on the year. Many of us are thinking about our goals for the new year and our new year's resolutions. So what better time to think about how you can own your career and make those steps to get where you wanna go in 2022. I wanna draw your attention to the Q&A box at the bottom. I know you're all familiar with Zoom, but uh, we would love for you to use that Q&A box and uh, type in your questions during the session. We'll have a, a bit of a time for panel and a great discussion, and then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. So we really encourage you to submit some questions for our panelists today. So without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator. Her name is Farrell Yuri, and Farrell is the Communications Director at Aurora. She's also a member of our Women in Autonomy events team. Farrell has a fantastic career of telling the stories and building the brands of really renowned companies like Square and Uber and Dropbox. And I think she's the perfect person to moderate this panel and to talk to our panelists today about how to own your career um, moving forward. So Farrell, welcome. Great, thanks so much, Jen, for inviting us to be a part of this panel. And just to give everyone a little bit of background, we're really excited to be here and having this discussion. And essentially, how did this come to be? We got together and we started thinking about how there's a lot of conversations that happen around careers, but a lot of those conversations often get into the realm of how can companies support us? How can managers and mentors support us? And that's an incredibly important discussion to have. But I think at the end of the day, a lot of us feel that we're actually in the driver's seat, pun intended, of our own careers. And so today we wanted to bring together some amazing women at leading companies who can actually talk about how they, with or without the support of companies or managers, have taken charge of their own career, both in the short term and the long term. And we're really going to try to give you tangible examples and colorful anecdotes and really clear pieces of advice. So when you leave, you have some action items, not to assign homework at like an extracurricular activity, but it'd be good if you left with a plan of like, here's some tangible things you could do in the next weeks, months, and years to really own your career. And so um, before we kick it off with questions, I'll introduce the panelists. So first we have Jessie, and she happens to be one of my favorite colleagues at Aurora. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it's true. She's a technical lead on the simulation team, and she's worked across the team leading horizontal projects for three years at Aurora, the self-driving car company where we both work. And before joining the self-driving industry, industry, she was inspired to work in simulation because she actually built a forest fire simulator in grad school. So that's a really fun fact. And then we have Julie who is a founder of TBD Robotics. She focuses on creating tools and infrastructure for safe and fast robotics development. And when she's not working on robotics, she's busy playing with her two sons. And finally, we have Apoorva. She's a technical program manager at Waymo, and she drives multiple cross-functional efforts, working alongside engineers and leadership to make safe autonomous vehicles a reality. So yes, self-driving cars will be a thing, and in grad school, she had the opportunity to work on a small satellite. So her fun fact is that her code now actually floats in space. So kicking it off with the panelists, if, if people want to unmute when, when you want to chat, um, kind of to the point of the panel driving your career forward, we really want to discuss this balance between asking your company and your manager to support your career, but also owning it yourself. And so we'd love to hear from our panelists about how can you be proactive? How can you be a problem solver? How can you move around the company with confidence? Essentially, how do you think about owning your career? So I think, Julie, if you want to kick us off, I think you have some advice for the group. Would love to hear it. And then we'll open it up for discussion with the panelists. Thanks, Pharrell. Thank you to Women in Autonomy for this opportunity to speak to everyone. I'm just very honored to be here. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I was excited to do this talk. And, and when we 
think about you know your career and how you can drive it forward there there is a balance of how do you kind of where do you find that support from within your own companies or you know multiple companies as, as you move through your career or how do you kind of drive yourself forward um, what I found personally is that um, companies really provide those opportunities for growth and for challenges um, you know your your manager or you know some project comes up where you know you're not really sure if you have that skill set for it but but you go ahead and you you take that challenge on and you work towards it even if you you know oh my gosh this is something to do with machine learning and i know nothing about machine learning um what i've found is that you you should really strive to kind of feel uncomfortable at work so that you're you're being challenged and you can try something new and then once you get into it you know just kind of figure it out as you go along ask for help along the way um, and that's a great way to progress forward through your career so just continue keep trying uh, I know I've I've experienced this uh, in my time you know where where I may know nothing about a project or um, you know, uh, an opportunity that comes up and you just try it and you figure it out and then you may stumble at first and that's okay. It's totally fine to make mistakes. We all have. Uh, it's also okay to get into something and realize, wow, I really hate managing or I hate this other thing. And that's cool. Like your company provided that opportunity to learn and figure out, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not good at this or this is just way out of my comfort zone um the other thing i would say is is there's uh, your career path is not always linear um in the sense that you know oh i should always be getting a promotion i should be getting something else um i, I found that there's a lot of lateral movement that happens um and I've actually learned more from those lateral opportunities than I have the ones that actually kind of move me up the ladder per se. Um, so that that would be my advice on how to find balance is to take those opportunities when when they're presented, um, but also you as an individual individual, you know, you've got to be reaching for those and taking those when when you can. Great. Julia or Porva, do you guys want to jump in, or Jesse and Porva? Sure. Yeah, I, I think I've benefited from lateral moves um, in, in a similar way that as, as you're describing, Julie, and the, the lack of linear career progression speaks to a very recent transition I made from a management role back to an individual contributor role. And it reminded me less of like backtracking or a big career change and more of a like a reset because I had learned a lot of valuable lessons, but now I can apply them in a new way in my technical lead role as opposed to um, in a management role. So it's it's more about like like exactly like you said, becoming being comfortable with being uncomfortable and sort of picking the things that seem the scariest um, because you grow a lot when you're in those modes. But also asking for help because that's the the right way to grow um, and not become overwhelmed. I'll plus one to whatever Julie and Jesse have said is exactly right. And I think it's sometimes we get bogged down by how society kind of describes what progress is and we chase kind of like the linear progression, but that doesn't have to be the case. I think it differs for every person. You could just stay in the same area and become an expert of that area. You can make lateral moves. It's whatever fits more with your vision and what fits with your interpretation of what, what do you like to do, what challenges you and what learning you're having. Um, so I would definitely feel less bogged down by, hey, this is what I'm expected to do. This is the only way to grow. This is like being a manager is the only way that I can make career progress. That's definitely not the case. And we should break away from that. And in my view so far, like I have mentored people on a, not in my like manager capacity. And that has been a great relationship that I have learned from that they have learned from. And then you kind of grow your career and you learn from that as well. So Keep an open mind and take the opportunities that are offered to you, even if they're challenging, even if you feel scared, because it's a lot of like learning on the job. I think when I was in college, I used to feel like, oh, I have to learn everything before I like join the workplace because I have to go out prepared. And then you go into work and you're like, it's a different world. And like you learn new things and like every company is different. You learn new things in every company you go to. So um, it's like a lifelong journey of learning. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think you also have to define your own definition of success because it's 
it's not going to be the same as your colleague's definition of success. I think every person has their own, their own idea and, and their own things that make them happy. So I would, I would encourage everyone, you know, while you're taking this time at the end of the year and laying out your goals and, and everything for the following years, also just take a step back and reflect on like, what is, what is my definition of success? What is it that I personally want to do with my life? And make sure you're you're mapping out your chart to hit those things, not like, just become a level whatever you know. Well, I mean, I'm happy to change. <laughs> yeah, it changes. Go ahead, Carol. Well, I was just just to kind of follow up on that note. Like, how do you stay true to your own definition of success? Because it's really easy to kind of be doom scrolling, and then you go on LinkedIn, and you're like, <laughs> "Oh, I used to work with that person, or I graduated with them from grad school. We were on the same track, and now they're a director." And I'm an L whatever. And yeah, we can sit in this panel and say, tr stay true to what matters to you. But like, we've all, I think, had that experience where we're like, oh, should I have done that? Should I be a manager? Because that seems more prestigious on my LinkedIn. So like, how do you actually stay true to yourself and your own definition of success? I personally am very lucky because I have an amazing husband who keeps me very well grounded on earth and reminds me all the time of, uh, uh, wait, you want to do what now? Um, are you sure? Because we were on this path and, you know, so it's, it's good to have somebody that you trust to, to kind of be your sounding board um, to make sure one, he keeps me reminded of like, what, what is the things that are really important in our lives? And for us, um, where we are right now in our lives is it's it's raising our boys and so everything that we do including our career paths is really kind of focused around that and so I you know my conversations with my husband really kind of drive where each of us are going in our career and I, I think for for me personally that's important to to have somebody kind of like keeping me on track and I keep him on track with like hey what what is really important do I really need to go to this thing or should I go to this that Do you sense. find that you've had experiences um, where you have, you know, made that mistake and thought, oh, I would love this job and then gotten into it and gone, oh, no, <laughs> let me reevaluate my priorities. Because I think that making mistakes like that has made it easier for me to build boundaries around my own expectations, because sometimes now I do look at a director role and think, I don't think I would like that job very much, or I, I don't think that's the right fit for what I want out of my career right now. But that's because I have made some decisions or you know, like a, a migration up into a manager of managers role where I realized that wasn't quite where I wanted to be right now. So I guess I'd be curious to know if you also had, <laughs> I don't wanna call it a mistake, but like learned lessons the hard way. <laughs> I, I, I would call them mistakes sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, for sure. I've, I've taken on things that, that required way more uh, effort and responsibility than, than I actually could a lot for myself. And, and because of that, you know, things in my personal life suffered um, because I was overextending myself at the office or, or whatever the case may be. And so, yeah, I, I had to dial it back. And, you know, my manager at the time was even like, um, you are stretching yourself way too thin. So again, it's it's really having kind of those anchor points in my life that that can, you know, bluntly tell me to my face that whoa, this you might want to reassess what you're doing here. But but it's good to have those. I, I guess I would encourage everyone to make sure that you've got some some people, some folks in your life who can really talk to you um, openly and honestly, um, so that you can make sure that you're you're getting those influences that you need. Because sometimes it's hard. We get caught up in our own little world and start spinning. And um, you know, certainly, uh, this group is is full of of people who want to drive their careers forward and um, continue up that ladder. And so it's good to have some anchor points along the way. Thank you for sharing. And also, I wanted to mention the Q and A. We'll we'll take audience Q and A at the end. And there's a Q and A box that's part of Zoom where you can start submitting questions. But feel free to also join the chat if you want to share your name and your company, or if you want to plus one something that resonates with you, um, or if you totally disagree. So I think I just sent a hello chat to the panelists and attendees. Um, this isn't necessarily the place to ask questions, but like. We'd love to learn from you all too, to kind of the point, it's not only the panelists um, sharing information. So feel free to kind of join um, 
the chat and to kind of continuing on, maybe going through your careers, it'd be interesting to hear from our panelists. Can you walk us through your career with a specific focus on changes that you made? And how did you decide to change industries? How did you decide to change companies? How did you decide to change roles, whether it's going from IC to manager, or as Jesse talked about, potentially going from a manager back to an IC role? That's, I guess I could start with that process, which I think is I know, you know, if you show in software, at least if you show leadership tendencies, the you get a lot of advice about like how you'd be a great manager. Um, and I, I think a lot of the times that's fair, but I also um, have been in situations where I felt like I was pushed into leadership roles before I was technically ready for them. And that was really stressful um, and hard to manage and actually was one of the reasons that I ended up changing from um, my previous job into like coming to working for Aurora because I felt like I could have better technical mentorship at Aurora just because of the team composition. Um, and Aurora actually did a really good job of sort of protecting me from that <laughs> push into management. Um, and then I sort of like was allowed to dip my toes in and was very supported by Aurora um, and had a very small team. Um, and then it sort of exploded overnight. Um, and I became a manager of managers and my whole roll up was like 25 people. And that is a very different job than a TLM of a small group of people leading projects. Um, and I really am glad I got the experience because it helped me learn that that's not really what I want right now. Um, but it, uh, I think the thing that made me the most uh, unhappy in that role was a misalignment of my own expectations for what I wanted to be doing and the reality of the role. I don't think I was doing a bad job at the role, but the things that I thought I needed to be doing to derive satisfaction from my job didn't match with what that role required of me. Um, and so that was one of the things that helped me make that decision to move back to an IC role, despite really loving the team that I was leading. It was a really wonderful group of people. And so it was, it was sort of a hard choice. Um, but ultimately I think made me a better um, engineer and leader in general. I can talk the transition of like going from a SWE. I started my career as a SWE when I graduated from Berkeley with IBM. And when I was a SWE, I kind of, over time, over my time in IBM, I grew to be like a process designer where I was looking more like end-to-end, -end, how things fit together. And then I became more of a solution architect, which involves like talking to the client, understanding what their needs were, figuring out how it maps to our products and like kind of designing the whole solution and then giving the spec to developers and working with them to see what we prioritize, what dependencies are. And I really enjoyed that part of it, like having that bigger picture and being able to drive impact that way. That when I moved to Pittsburgh from Singapore, when I, where I was in IBM, I had a couple of different choices. I could have stayed with IBM and kind of continued my role because they also had a team here. I could have applied for a similar like SWE role for another company or kind of try something different, which I had heard about, which was a technical program management track, which isn't really, it was kind of coming up at that point. There were some companies that had it, some companies really have it, but I saw an opening at ADG, which was technical program management. Um, so I reached out to one of my friends who was at ADG, who was actually in that role to understand like what the day to day looked like, what the scope was, to see if it actually fit. I also spoke to another friend in a different company to see how different it was, because like, it does tend to like differ in different companies a little bit. And um, I applied, even though I did not meet all the prerequisites <laughs> for the role. And I was super nervous um, applying for the role. And I met with the team, the panel. It was amazing the day that we interviewed with the team. And when they finally made an offer, they were very clear. They were like, you don't meet all the, the credentials that we needed for this role, but you seem to like have done similar type of things, even though it's not the correct job title. So it was more of like a lateral, I would say even like a seniority and emotion in some sense, but it brought me like to industry that I wanted to go back to, which is robotics and work with some amazing people. Um, it let me try a new role from like a suite to TPM. So it was a great experience. And I think the three key takeaways I got from that was like, um, don't get boxed into your title or what title you own, because you should really look at what aspects of the job that you like. And if there are other people that are observing and their job roles that you like, like explore that. Um, definitely reach out to people and talk to them to understand what their day-to-day -day looks like. So you can understand like, hey, the job role, like the title and the actual implementation of what they do day-to-day -day can be very different. Um, and thirdly, don't be afraid of making lateral moves like we Julie mentioned earlier. 
there are some great growth opportunities. They can, if they fit your career vision of like moving to a different industry or starting a different role, they're totally worth it. And um, to be honest with you, when I took that role and I hit, I was like, oh no, I'm like getting level set. But because I enjoyed that role so much, it performed well, I was able to get a promotion like off cycle in like six months. So you do get those opportunities to grow back and you don't have to feel kind of inhibited by, oh man, I'm going to take a pay cut or a seniority cut and if it's worth it or not. So definitely like think through those factors of how it fills and in, fits into your vision, career, long-term vision and make the switch. I know I'm so glad you decided to be, become a TPM. <laughs> she is fantastic, everyone. <laughs> I'm very lucky to have worked with you before my interest in the past. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with everything you said. Definitely look for, for all those opportunities wherever you can find them up the ladder laterally. Um, I, I can say for, for my career, um, I am not a roboticist by trade and you'll notice that I am now a, a co-founder of a robotics company. So that's quite an interesting uh, journey. Um, I, I joined uh, the National Robotics Engineering Center uh, here in Pittsburgh um, a while back. I had spent a few years in industry doing um, just software engineering for a variety of companies. Um, I joined the National Robotics Engineering Center not knowing anything about robotics, um, but I loved it. I was able to find a little niche that I could uh, fit with my skill set, and I just started talking to people. I started talking to uh, people on my software, in my software team. I started talking to mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, just really anyone who would talk to me um, and tell me a little bit about kind of what they do. And, and um, you know, uh, as Porv was mentioning, just trying to figure out all the pieces of the puzzle, you know, on that horizontal um, level, just, just trying to understand how everything fit together. And I loved that. I loved understanding the whole system, um, you know, various robotics projects as I, as I moved along. And it was just so fun that I wanted to continue <laughs> learning about it. Um, and so with my career tran transitions, I just ended up following people that I enjoyed working with that, that were just fun to be around and who were, um, very open and uh, with their knowledge and willing to share it. And so um, a piece of advice I would give to everyone is to look outside your immediate team. Um, uh, try to understand the whole landscape of, of whatever project you're working on, your company, um, because I think what you'll find is that um, you can get insights um, that, that benefit that, that could benefit from your skill set on this other team or this other project. Uh, and it's really cool because that will allow you to find more opportunities as well as like start to build out your network um, because there will be other things that come up that, you know, oh, wow, you know, you have this opening for this cool thing. I know how to do that cool thing. Maybe we should talk and, and I can help fill a gap or, wow, I don't understand this thing, but I know you know something about that. Maybe we could work together. Um, Something that worked well for um, the women's group at, at ATG was we had a, I don't remember what we called it, but it was like a, a, a learning session where we would have, um, again, the women's group at ATG was, was across all of Uber ATG. And so that was um, people from all different aspects of, of uh, autonomous vehicles. And so everyone had a different skill set and we would meet up occasionally over lunch, just very casual. And then someone would just talk about what they do, you know, like, hey, I'm an expert on being a TPM. Let me tell you what that means. Um, or, hey, I know all about uh, machine learning. Let's, I'll just tell you what that means. And it was really great to, one, learn these new skills or just understand the, the terminology, the language you would hear around the office, um, as well as just kind of start to build out your network. One, one question, Julie, just yeah. to follow up on that. I love how you said, reach out to people outside your team. High level, completely agree. My question is how, like literally like what should we say? How should we do it? Is it a Slack? Is it an email? Do we like follow them around to their desk and tap them <laughs> on the shoulder? Like how do you kind of develop these relationships or start these conversations? I love it. Yeah. For me, it's just kind of very organic and, you know, in the sense of like, oh, someone will, will say like, hey, this thing isn't working. And I'll be like, well, what is that thing? Can you tell me a little bit about that? What does that mean? And just start to dig in there just to 
understand, you know, what are the things that they're passionate about, but really, I think it can be from, from anywhere, you know, anything from, you know, hanging out at the, I, I mean, it doesn't really work right now in our Zoom world, but, you know, hanging out to get coffee, uh, you know, while you're standing in lunch line, um, in a meeting, uh, uh, I, I found great success with, um, groups and organizations that are uh, more social, you know, your, your employee resource groups, um, you know, maybe there's a group of people who like to go to the gym or, you know, wherever the case may be, wherever you can kind of meet your, your diverse group of, uh, of, of folks that you can interact with and learn more about their skill sets. I don't know if you guys have other, have other suggestions oh. on how to make your connections. <laughs> I think one other thing is like what I've done before is if there's like a usually most major, major of the companies have these presentations where like one team presents and like they'll do a walkthrough of their tech. I reach out to presenters going like, oh, I really like this. Like, can I dig in more? Can I learn more? And you'll be surprised at how excited they are to share and to like give you a like deep dive into it. So like definitely feel free. I think there's like more of a mental block when you're like, oh, I don't know if this person is super busy. Like, should I slap them? Should I send them a thing? But I think, I would not say 100%, but 80% of the times, I'm sure they'll give you a very good response if they're not super busy. And even if they're busy, they might come back to you like a week or so, but they make the connection, there's no harm. Like the worst cases, you might get a cool shoulder, but so far in my time, whenever I've reached out to people, they've always come back with like even more enthusiastic response than I had going in. And then you get to learn a lot because they can also connect you to other people. Like sometimes if you ask somebody a question, they don't know what the right answer is, or they, they're not clear with it. They'll say like, oh, reach out to so-and-so person. And then that's how you kind of build your network out. Definitely second, do we succession about like social groups are a great way because they're diverse already. You see people from all different parts of the company. I know it's harder right now with Zoom. So you don't have those like lunch line water flow conversations, but like once we go back to work, that's also a great opportunity where just sit with someone different at the lunch table when you go in like once a week, maybe not every day, but once a week, try sitting with a different group. So you kind of learn about them. I think there's a mental shift and that's helped me between being afraid to bother someone and making that mental shift to like, actually people kind of like talking about themselves. They like talking about their careers and they feel pretty flattered. If you reach out and say like, I want to be you when I grow up, or I want to expand my skill set to include what you know how to do, or I want to hear more about your grad school research project and how that led you there. And so if you go in with the mindset that people actually enjoy sharing their career advice, it makes it a little less intimidating. And then my second piece of advice is make it a good use of the other person's time as well. And so it's not like you have to have a perfect agenda and send it ahead of time, but let them know from the onset, like, Hey, what I'm really hoping to get out of the conversation is to help, um, to talk through whether I want to be an IC or a manager, or whether I want to be an, en a SWE, an engineer, or I want to be a technical program manager. So let them know like what you're getting out of it and do your research beforehand. So you're not like, so which department are you in? Like do your homework so that the conversation is as valuable as possible. So that that's how I would think about kind of the how of expanding your network. Um, one, one other question I wanted to ask, and this is kind of selfish because I always wonder this too, is when people talk about their careers, it sounds like it was so purposeful and thoughtful. And I'm always wondering like, did you literally like plot out your career? Like you have the doc that's like one year plan, five year plan, 10 year plan. Cause I've heard of people that have that. If so, what does that doc look like? And how can I create one? And if not, like, how have you thought about your career and plan, like planning it out? I'm definitely making it up as I go. I, <laughs> I guess I just pick whatever seems like I, I have a completely greedy algorithm approach where I just pick the thing that seems the most interesting or the most challenging at every career decision. Um, and you do sometimes hit pivot points. Like I felt like very recently with this transition back to it, I see, I felt like I had many very reasonable paths ahead of me and I just had to sit down and try to really think about what makes me happy. And maybe that isn't going to be tied to a promotion. Maybe that's not going to be tied to like climbing a ladder of some kind. Maybe that is just working with a really incredible group of people learning a lot. Um, and so sometimes you know, like finding the way to challenge myself includes a lateral shift or something like that. Um, but someone once gave me the advice that has been really helpful to me um, when I was deciding whether or not to leave the ATG and join Aurora. Um, 
he asked me, what do I want my next, next job to be? So instead of looking at the decision immediately in front of you, which can be really hard to say like, what do I want to do in the next year of my life? Um, I look at the people sort of in a, a skip level role or some next, next job role and decide like, I think actually that's the career I want my, or the, the direction I want my career to be pulling in. Um, or maybe I don't want to be going in another direction. And that has helped me make it easier to point the direction I try to go, but still just make it up every day. <laughs> I would agree with Jesse. I think like our industry is so fluid. There's so many opportunities that within 10 years, you don't even know where the industry is going to go. And a lot of times it comes up to, are you enjoying where you are? Are you feeling challenged? Is there something more exciting that you want to kind of hop over and try? And I think I try to keep my options open where um, if I find that I'm not growing enough in my current role, or I see a great opportunity where I can learn more, whether it's a, with the team I want to work with, or the industry they're working on, or the tech they're working on, then I definitely like prioritize that and kind of use that to decide when is the right time to switch, or if there's a different like lateral or upward move that I want to make um, from that perspective. But I definitely don't have a good like, hey, here is the roadmap for how you plan a ten-year career. <laughs> Just think how much money you could make if you had that sort of rubric. No. That would be amazing. <laughs> I mean, maybe we should all be doing that. <laughs> make an yeah, app I, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I'm with Justine and Porva. There, there. I don't have a, a plan. I'm making it up as I go along. And yes, you know, just to, to what Jesse said, I just kind of, you know gear towards what's making me happy. I, I would encourage everyone to make sure, you know, like take take this time to just double check to make sure you're happy and that this is something, you know, wherever you are right now in life, that this is where you want to be and this is where, what you want to pursue. Um, I, just, just, I would make sure you're following that. And if you're happy and, and you're still feeling challenged, you're still feeling motivated, continue. Um, and make sure you're looking for those opportunities. That's that's what I've done with my career is just continued, you know, as long as as I'm happy and, and I'm feeling like I'm making an impact, um, keep pushing forward for sure. What about some of the groups or organizations that you all have found to be helpful in supporting your career trajectory and your growth? And one, I actually think this is a good time to mention that Women in Autonomy, who's hosting this panel, is actually an organization that does offer mentorship. And so, Jen, I think if you want to share just in the chat with any links where people can get more involved with Women in Autonomy or Perfect, um, the mentorship program, encourage everyone to sign up. And I was curious to hear um, both you know, people on the chat, feel free to throw out um, organizations and then our panelists, like what are the actual orgs and groups we can join? And if you can send out links to them, that's even more helpful. So I'll call out one big shout out to Julie because she kind of set up the woman and uh, woman a group in ADG. I think that was super, it was such a wholesome, super supportive group that we had where you knew you always had a backup, like you had somebody to go to and learn from. And I think it also offered us this opportunity of like, from everything like, promotion advice, career advice, role models, and giving you those kind of pointers to make, to help you um, see where you want to advance your career next or what you could be doing differently was great. And I think figuring out how you can set up that committee within your company is also really good because they know what the ins and outs of it, they can actually support you and be your sponsors or mentors um, in a way that outside communities cannot in some ways. But the other thing I would like to see, uh, I would like to call out is, um, also, I mean, Women in Autonomy is a great example where you can kind of talk to women in similar industry, similar interests and learn from them and network because that's a great way to kind of find out your next opportunity because when you network with someone and they have something opening up, they reach out to you and that's a fabulous way of kind of growing um, all of us together, right? Because we are in this together and that's what really makes a difference that has happened in my career as well where I've had mentors guide me, not only from like, career girl, but how do you manage work and life and kids? Julie has been my mentor who has like <laughs> taught me how to remain sane <laughs> with all the different moving pieces and changes that happen in your life. So um, definitely reach out to ERG groups within your company and then things like women autonomy. 
yeah, definitely have to plus one to find yourself a Julie because Julie yes. has also been a wonderful mentor to me <laughs> and many, many other women. Um, I guess the thing that I would probably add is uh, I don't think you should limit yourself to thinking about mentors uh, per whatever your career role is. Um, I've had mentors in other parts of the organization who have helped me along my career path. And even a lot of my um, collaborations with Farrell have been incredibly influential on the way that I approach every other part of my career. And so those getting interactions with diverse people and with diverse skills and backgrounds can be even more beneficial than a, a technical uh, mentor in a lot of ways. Absolutely, I 100% I agree with that. Also, thank you both, <laughs> that was very kind. Um, <laughs> I, I would also encourage everyone to to reach out to, um, I, I found a lot of uh, help from Society of Women Engineers, even if it wasn't, you know, I was directly talking to anyone. It was just so nice to be part of a, a club that where I knew I could go to for advice on like, wow, I'm the only person, I'm the only woman in the, in the room. How do you guys deal with this? And e even if it was, they weren't in my industry, what at all, you know, they at least had some advice, you know, I, I think I was at a, a, I was fresh out of college and I went to, to some um, meeting on, on how to be more assertive and more confident. And uh, the woman who was, who was giving the, the talk, you know, when I said like, oh, but isn't it so weird being the only, you know, woman in the, war, in the room? And she was like, you just put on your big girl panties and you go do it. It's okay. You got this. And it was just so inspiring to hear someone just, just say, find the confidence. You have it inside of you. You can do it. Um, so I would encourage everyone to just reach out and, and, and find those organizations. They, they're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. There's all sorts of wonderful groups. Um, and and if, make your own too. I mean, that's, that's what we did at Uber. We, we made our own. It was great. One other thing I want to just add a plug for is also conferences are really great. Like I went to Grace Hopper and it was a wonderful experience to see all the women there too. And they had all these different tracks. And like Julie is saying, there was one session on like, how do you handle imposter syndrome? And that resonated. And just seeing all those women there discussing how do you actually tactically make improvements or like change and be confident? It was, it was amazing experience. So if you get a chance, like definitely sign up for it. If you have organizations, companies that can sponsor it, do that, like push them for it. There are a lot of companies that actually have opportunities where they'll send you for conferences. So like, take it up and make sure you attend them. That's great. And hopefully um, all of you who are listening in are able to open up the chat because people are sharing a ton of different links to organizations and mentorship programs. So um, as soon as the this night is over, then those go away. So make sure to copy them down to your own notepad um, so you can have them. So this conversation has been very positive, which is great, but I want to know like, what's a tough situation that you've navigated or what's a piece of career advice that you got that you're so happy you ignored? Like, let's dig in a little on some of the less kind of positive stuff, but in a way, like how have you actually come to the other side of it? And what can we learn from the things that like didn't go well or the career advice that actually wasn't great and you're glad you ignored? Um, <laughs> I think... I'm happy to start. Um, I've received several times in my career uh, feedback along the lines of watch your tone. Um, and the first time this ever happened, I was told that more junior engineers, this was I think my first or second year of being a professional, like out of school. Um, people told me that other junior engineers on the team thought I was mean and mean in code review specifically. And that was pretty devastating to hear. And I thought, because I don't want to be mean, I I try to be very friendly and approachable in all of my interactions. And so I I felt very badly that I could possibly be negatively impacting my, my colleagues this way. Um, and I tried to course correct immediately and tried to change my tone in how I was doing code review. And then I got the feedback that I was being condescending. And I thought, well, mean is better than condescending. Um, and I, I started watching my, uh, my communications and I was mirroring the way I was doing code review uh, um, against the senior male technical leads that I had. And I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't calling anyone dumb. I was just talking about the code and what needed to change. Um, and so I, after receiving this you know, second round of feedback, I decided, 
obviously I'm, I'm either missing something or something else has got to give uh, because if I go out of my way to be approachable in person and this person six, sits, you know, like everybody else sits three seat, seats away from me and they don't, like if I'm never mean to them in person, why would they then think I'm mean to them in code review? Um, and I, I have just sort of decided that the amount of effort I put into being approachable and offering to help new people as they're onboarding and putting together the only on onboarding documentation on the team. And I do a lot of extra work already that it's not in that, you know, like it should make me a little more approachable um, because I can be very direct in my written communication. And so I understand that and I am mindful of it, but I, I've just decided that the watch your tone feedback that I get is gonna go in one ear and out the other at this point, because there's very little else I can do <laughs> to make it, to be more approachable. I guess one difficult thing that I think I've navigated is um, when I was leading a program at ADG, we would have these like big meetings. And sometimes when you go into big meeting with all the senior leads, you tend to shy away from taking a seat at the table because you just feel like, oh, I'm not sure if I deserve to like take this thought. And this is more when you were in a physical team. I think now it's so much better with Zoom and this like whole sequence of raising your hand and calling out. Um, and that was definitely something where I felt like all the other people in the room, and I tended to be the only female sometimes in these meetings, were able to kind of voice over and say their thoughts out and even interrupt. But I would always be like waiting for this turn to speak up or be called out on to like say my opinion. And, um, there was more of an inhibition to like interrupt somebody and say something. But what I realized is um, I actually worked with a manager and they said, you know, talk to someone before the meeting, if you, what do you want to say? And they can help kind of call out to you. And that once you get into the why of doing it, then you can also support other people where you notice like somebody's trying to say something and they're not being called on or they're not getting a chance. You can be that person who kind of says, Hey, I think somebody has this to say. Um, and so this is something I've learned over my time or my career on how do you own, yes, you deserve to be in that spot. You deserve to take a seat at the table. Um, despite like everybody else in the room, you're no, you're no less and you shouldn't feel the imposter syndrome of like, oh, I don't know if I deserve it or not. And also support each other when you see somebody not being able to express themselves or get called out, like be that person who makes that change to make everybody more, feel more inclusive. I love that. I love, I love the idea of, uh of identifying folks who might be too shy to talk during a meeting and, and giving them an opportunity. And I agree that that Zoom has really been a, a, a great um, level setter in, in the sense of everyone kind of has their uh, their face time, <laughs> uh, if, if your video is working, um, <laughs> and getting that opportunity to talk. Um, uh, another another way I've kind of seen that work is is if you kind of like collaborate on a, a document or, or something, you know, people feel a little bit more at ease making comments or, or you know, uh, sharing their uh, ideas and thoughts, you know, through some other medium other than face to face. Um, but definitely reaching out and, and giving opportunities to those that you see like might need a little push to, to get there is, is super helpful. Great. And we want to start opening it up, I think, to, to questions, if you feel free to throw it in the chat, the Q&A, and we have a question from Hannah. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. She asks, any advice or tips when kickstarting a women's group in the office? So I think we've had some of you all who have done that. So how do you actually start that group? I, I love this. I would, I would really encourage you to, to start a women's group. I, I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, I would advise you to, to lay out some goals um, you know, what do you want the, the group to accomplish um, or, you know, or what do you want the group to, to, to signify and to be? Um, we started our group uh, right around the time that the Me Too movement was happening. Um, and so a real focus of, of our women's group was to just provide a, a space where um, women could just speak freely and, and feel, have like a safe environment to talk. Um, and to just share experiences with each other. And from there, we were really able to kind of shift it into um, more of a group that would um, uh, support and, and uh, provide opportunities for growth. As, as Jesse and Apurva mentioned, we had um, opportunities where we would, we would do kind of career talks and bring in um, 
bring in the engineering managers to give advice and um, help think about, you know, how you would write your uh, performance reviews and re performance reviews for others because uh, I never learned that in school and it wasn't until I got to a big company where I even learned what performance reviews were. So, um, you know, those would, that would be my advice is to really sit down first and think about, well, what, what do you want this group to be? And then um, that's going to change every year or every six months, you know, depending on how quickly you're growing or, or whatever the case may be. Um, uh, something we did was, was we were constantly reevaluating what we wanted to do and to be. And um, I will definitely say the women's group that we started is not the women's group that we, we were, you know, three years later. And that was great because it, it evolved with the group. <laughs> One other like thing I would like to add to Julie's is like that's a great idea. You can also start really small, um, like start with a Slack channel or a chat group or at least like a mailing list or um, start with a social event first. Like you can just set up like lunches every month and get together and then kind of build up from there. So the starting point has like not as big of a <laughs> jump in terms of effort and involvement, but it gets people together. It gets people ideating, and once you get into the rhythm, it's super easy. Like I. Um, I think it's, we underestimate the value of kind of all the women coming together and sharing ideas, even just talking um, and having that kind of safe space to discuss and bounce off ideas. It's great. So like, it doesn't have to be a very detailed, like big undertaking. It could be something very small and intimate to begin with and then kind of expand from there. Yeah. Two things I've seen work that are kind of lightweight. One is bringing in a guest speaker and it doesn't have to be like, Kamala Harris, the VP, it can be, hey, I have a friend in another company who just did something cool. Let's all get in a room or a Zoom and talk to her. And the other lightweight one is an article or a podcast and saying like, I read a book, an article, a podcast. Would anyone want to get in a room for 30 minutes and kind of chat through what resonated, what didn't? Um, so that, that was interesting. Another question that we had um, from Allison was, does physically working in an office advance one's career? This is a hot topic right now. <laughs> I think that probably depends um, on the type of work you're interested in doing. I think that my career has definitely benefited from very organic connections that I make with other engineers or other people in the company. Um, but I work in a very um, horizontal role uh, where I do a lot of integration or work with the, the internal customers that my team has. Um, and so being able to, you know, follow someone to their desk and say, hey, who are you? You seem really interesting <laughs> is actually useful for me. And I'm, um, I guess, comfortable at this point doing that, uh, which is not always easy to do. Um, but I can see like being in the office, I think is better for building those human connections and building a a team, like it's better for a team, but I also understand the constant interruptions or the distractions in your open office workspace can be really um, challenging to navigate when you're trying to get like individual work done. So I think being at home is also, it's totally fine to sit down and if you're a software engineer like me, just turn off Slack and email and everything and write as much code as you need to write and then get it landed and move on with your day. Um, that can be really valuable too. So I kind of think there's a, a hybrid mode that makes a lot of sense. I'm thinking back to um, my husband, he's meeting with his team this week and he was sharing, I don't have time to meet with the team because I have so much work and he really wanted to be heads down on the actual work. And something that I shared with him and feel free to disagree with me is meeting with your team and working with the team and having lunch with them or hearing how they work. Like that is actually part of your job and that's going to make the actual heads down work easier. So I would encourage everyone, at least this has been a successful point in my career is make the time to do that too. And don't see that as like taking away from your heads down work, but actually something that's going to accelerate the work. So I think that's interesting. Um, feel free to add um, if there's anything else on that point. And then I also want to bring up this other question from Carol. Um, what is your work-life balance looking like? So another hot topic, I'm sure. I think it's harder now with like COVID and Zoom and all the schedule thing. Uh, all right. Um, it's just in a disarray, but I think one advice that I 
really took to heart was, um, I think somebody mentioned to me that you're kind of balancing balls in the air and each ball is either like glass or plastic. And it doesn't have to be that all your personal things are plastic and all the work things are glass. It's like, you know, some deadlines are, you can miss them, they can be delayed, it's fine. Some things on the personal front, you do want to attend, like it's very important and those are important. And every day you're kind of balancing like what balls are okay to drop because you're human and you cannot keep everything up in the air. And if it's a plastic ball, like it's cool. It'll come back up. You can like finish that email tomorrow. It's not, it's okay. No one's going to like be upset over it if it's 12 hours late. But if you're going to attend something from family or like make that dinner, that is important, do that. And it's a personal choice. I think it differs for everyone. But one key thing is don't feel guilty about it. You're going to sometimes make the wrong choices and that's okay. You learn from that and you kind of do it better next time. But feel free to take that leverage that yes, there are some plastic balls and you can let them fall <laughs> um, and not stretch yourself so thin that you don't, you have an empty cup. Because if you're, um, if you have an empty cup, there's no way you can support everybody else in your life. I absolutely agree with that. I, I know with, um, when I became a mother, I had a really hard time with work-life balance and I ended up reading this book. I didn't even finish it. It was called Good Enough is the New Perfect. So it's ironic I didn't even finish it. <laughs> the advice to heart. Um, but it was it was realizing, as Apoorva mentioned, you know, in my mind, all the balls were glass and they're not. It it's fine to let some things drop. Um, and that's that's okay. But yeah, you have to realize you have to look at your life again, defining your own success, defining what's important to you, and then you figure out which ones need your full attention and which ones are okay to just let go and being okay with letting something go it's fine also you know uh, uh back to pharrell like you got to make sure that you're you're keeping your network healthy of of your peers um because they'll support you when you need to drop something like hey i can't make this meeting i know it's really important can you just fill me on the details so you need to have that healthy you know, peer-to-peer -peer connection so that, you know, you can kind of cover for each other. So I, I agree, you really do need to make sure that you, you're keeping your, your network, your pool of, of supporters healthy. Well, you just remind me of this other book I really like, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Because I'll be honest, when you just said, hey, you're going to have to drop some balls, you can't do everything. I like cringed because I'm like, no, I feel like I've gone to where I am in my career because I haven't dropped any. But I think just because that maybe has gotten us to where we are in a career, it doesn't mean that if you're going to the next phase, you're able to do that. Whether the next phase is becoming a spouse, a parent, an executive, like I'm sure all of our managers, um, they can't do everything because they just have too much to do. So what got you here won't get you. There's an, another recommendation. Um, just wanted to see if you all had any closing thoughts and then I'm going to pass it over to Jen just to close us out. But maybe like one takeaway that if, hey, if people tuned out this entire time, I hope they didn't, what's at least the one thing that they should kind of <laughs> jot down quickly right now and remember before the session ends? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I would just encourage everyone to remember that you're in charge. You um, need to take the opportunities when presented. Um, and it's okay if, if you back away from them after trying them out and realizing, well, mistake, this isn't, this isn't me, this isn't what I like. That's okay. But you do need to make sure that you're, you're growing um, and that you're driving yourself forward. So, you know, however you need to do that, you know, look for the look for the support groups look for opportunities outside your own team you know start growing your network don't be afraid to to be challenged take those lateral shifts wherever you can and continue to grow up the ladder yeah. i think one thing i would like to say is um make sure you get feedback and you get feedback often and like early and not just from your manager but from like your peers the cross cultural teams you work with because everyone provides you a different perspective and it really helps you figure out where your blind spots are and what you need to kind of focus on to get to the next level. Because I think a lot of times you feel like you're at the next level, you're not really sure if you're at the next level, but like having that open conversation and kind of identifying like, okay, if this is what's required for me to be performing as for the next level, where am I lacking? And how can my manager, my mentors, my sponsors help support me in that journey to get there? Whether it's like giving me the right projects, give me the right exposure, uh, whatever it is, but like having that clarity really helps. 
yeah, I definitely think feedback is a, a so, so valuable. And I think if you just are struggling to figure out, like, I don't really know what I want with my career. I don't know how to even decide that. I think if you just evaluate what is really scary to you, like, do you think you're up for a promotion, but you're afraid to ask your manager about it, or you're afraid to try to say to your manager, I think I need a promotion and this is why. Um, or I was like, physically shaking and sweating while I negotiated my salary with like Aurora when I joined and it was the worst thing ever but now the next time you go and do it it's like ripping a band-aid off you realize it is kind of like tense and awkward in the moment but you you kind of get used to it and feedback is the same way where asking for feedback can be really scary because what if I'm bad at my job <laughs> and they all have realized it you know um but it's once you get into the mode of being comfortable in that like semi discomfort uh place it, it becomes a lot easier to try and push those boundaries um, and figure out what you want and we have one last question that i want to get to before we pass it back to jen from women in autonomy um, it actually comes from anchu and she said how do you actually figure out what's important and not important in your own life any tips and techniques i'll just say there's different values exercises that i found online where it literally has you circle like words that are important so Throw, I'm going to throw that out there, but panelists, yeah, how do you actually figure out what's important or not? There was this interesting exercise that I did last year, which is like write a letter to yourself a year from now and like envision what you would want to be in a year from now. And I think that was like eye opening in some ways because when I started writing that letter, I realized my priorities are actually like where I see myself in a year was different than when I was thinking in the moment. I thought that exercise was actually really good to figure out where do I want to focus my energy? Is it family? Is it work? Is it like my well-being, my mental health, um, and kind of thinking, the, the exercise of thinking through it was super um, insightful for me. So that's something you can try at the end of year coming up <laughs> to kind of figure out what's important to you. That's really good. I'm going to try that tonight. <laughs> Yes. So if people have other ideas, feel free to throw it into the chat in the next couple of minutes. Otherwise we'll throw it back to Jen to, to close us out. And I really like a lot of the comments here. People are saying they appreciate the open discussion. They left with good nuggets and um, someone committed to writing a letter and that, that was a good suggestion. So now it's, it's, it's in the chat. So we're holding you to it, but thank you all to the panelists and, and back to Jen. Thank you, Farrell, Julie, Jesse, and Porva. I love your transparency. Thank you for putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, talking about your lives and your careers and your priorities. I think it's it's such a welcome conversation and really appreciate you doing this. Um, I am a note taker and I'm gonna give you my Cliff Notes version of like my takeaways from this. So I loved when Julie said um, to make your own definition of success and talking about having that inner circle of advisors and finding out sort of what's true to you. Um, it was really interesting hearing Jesse talk about like it's not this linear path necessarily and to really, to really figure out what's Im important to you and your career and your personal life and, and, um, and go with your gut on that. Um, I also love the advice being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I think all of us don't like being uncomfortable. So it was, and Julie even said, strive to feel uncomfortable at work, which is like, ah, who's gonna, <laughs> who's gonna sign themselves up for that? But it's, you know, that's when we learn. So um, love that piece of advice. Um, also, um, Apoorva's glass and plastic analogy was so great and just really, I mean, in my words, giving yourself some grace and it's okay to let some of those plastic balls fall, as you said. Um, really good advice. And then finally, finding a network of support. And, and Jesse said, find a Julie. So <laughs> I, I think, you know, whether it's in your company or in your industry or in your, you know, friend group or network, I, I think that is really important. And it's something um, at AI that, you know, we're just starting, even though we initiated Women in Autonomy, we're just starting a women's network at work. And, and I thank you for the encouragement on that. So thank you again, ladies. Um, I, you know, for those of you um, who I think you saw in the chat, we had uh, a link to our mentorship program at Women, at Women in Autonomy, a link to our newsletter. We also help 
um, get speaking slots at conferences. I know somebody had put in the chat that it's great practice giving presentations. Um, we'd love to help you find um, speakerships at different conferences. So you can see on the slide, these are all the ways to follow us and to email us. So um, please do sign up for those things so you can stay abreast. We do a quarterly newsletter as well. Um, if you are headed to CES and you know who knows what this year will look like, but there's several of us who will be attending, please feel free to reach out to Info at Women in Autonomy. We would love to connect with you there. And uh, we just wish you all really happy holidays, a great end to the year and a fantastic 2022. So thanks for joining us. Bye all, happy holidays.